Good afternoon. Happy Friday. Welcome to the Wealth Whisperers. New focus today. We're looking at health of your business. This is a change of pace, but because health is wealth and we'd like to build wealth, I feel strongly this is a good time of the year to basically bring back the basics in terms of giving your business, your goals, a checkup. And obviously some life-saving strategies with CPR. So please remember those three letters as we go through our time together today. I'll share them with you now quickly. We're going to expand on them in the next hour or so. To be successful and have a good, solid health strategy of your business plan, you need three simple concepts. Consistency, persistency, and resiliency. So very quickly, take a look at those three words in your business model, in your life, and what do you feel is the most consistent thing you do? What is a strategy that's the most persistent thing you do? And most importantly, what's the most resilient thing you do? And how have you practiced resiliency when sometimes times are tough? So let's look at CPR from that perspective and realize we're going to start off with some very basic understanding of what your, your life should be like. And that's basically a SWOT analysis. And I'm sure at some point in time, you've either done one or read about one or uh, spent more time on a regular basis with one. But it's basically a concept put out by the Boston Consulting Group years ago. It is still used very, very widely in the corporate world. Many of my corporate clients consistently use a SWOT analysis in their day-to-day -day goals. So let's look at that from the standpoint of your strengths, your weaknesses, your opportunities, and your threats. And I put up just a quick question on each one. What are the main strengths that you have as an agent or you as a team member or you as a brokerage, if you own a brokerage or work at a brokerage? What are some of the things that make your you, make your team, or make your company better than someone else? See, it's good, better, best, never let it rest. If you can do as good as your better, best, there's always room for improvement. There's always room for growth. But what pulls you out of the commodity market of agents, of teams, or of companies into the specialty market that will sell you and amaze your clients? So the first thing you have to realize is your strengths. And if you have strengths, don't be bashful. My strength is negotiations. My second strength is wealth building and trying to not lose money and trying to build a lifestyle. But my fee, main fee focus is my negotiation skills. What are yours? And then let's be honest. There's always people that have some opposite ends, the weaknesses. Could be your personality style. Could be your quick to make a decision. But what are some of the things that are holding you back? What's a weakness? Was it easier not to go on that listing appointment? Was it easier not to follow up? Many, many agents lose a lot, a lot of business because they don't follow up. They don't stay in touch. They don't know the value of the time perspective in real estate. Those are just a few examples. So let's be honest with you because only you and the person in the mirror can have the most honest relationship as a real estate agent. Once you at least identify your weaknesses and then the six hardest words in the English language to say, I admit I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. I'm going to change that. That's the first step to eliminating weaknesses with strengths. And here's the key. The more strengths you have in your business model, in your relationships, in your routine, in your resiliency, the less places there are for weaknesses to come in there. Because your life of real estate is filled up with strengths. No room for the weaknesses. They get blown away. Then we got to look at the concept of opportunities. What do you see in the current or future market that could help your business? 
we're in a whole different world, as we well know. Multiple offers are there. Interest rates are up and continually rising, but they're not as bad as many people think they are. There's a lot of opportunities for, for new business. There's a lot of opportunities to go after different types of things. For example, last week, we spent some time looking at using a HELOC to replace the first mortgage. And many of you emailed me or texted me and said, I applied for that credit card. Somebody said they're already using it and got a credit line of 50000 That sure is an opportunity that when it knocks, you better be ready to answer the door. So what opportunities in your marketplace, in your growth model, are able to be looked at seriously and made a decision to move them into an activity you're going to do that will benefit you? And then above all, we have to realize in the SWOT analysis, there are threats. Companies are changing models, uh, some issues with maybe some of the things that certain rules and regulations of your village or township or county or state are putting on you for house showing, signage laws, et cetera. But what are some threats? And, and I don't believe your competition is a threat. I believe that your competition should be an opportunity for you to get better. That's why the most successful businesses oftentimes open up next to another successful business. So if you feel a new agent or a new company or a new team is coming into your market area, I don't see that as a threat unless you perceive it as a threat. But in the meantime, what are you doing to change the future to move it into a better part of your business plan? Once again, you don't need them all, you don't want them all, and you ain't going to get them all. So as we look at the SWOT analysis as the first step, you need to do this probably at least quarterly. Just look at yourself and say, okay, what did I do better? What strengths did I increase? What weaknesses did I eliminate? What weaknesses did I eliminate? And what are some new opportunities that I never took advantage of or I should be taking advantage of as the markets change, as um, the interest rates change, as there's some new opportunities in financing from government programs, et cetera? And what are some threats? Once you do that, you're starting the process of building a better, healthy business model, hence the CPR. With that said, another way of looking at it from some ideas in how businesses look at this, just to give you a few thoughts. What's some good demand for middle income properties? And I don't know what middle income means to you. I don't know what luxury means to you. But what are some middle income properties that could be either trade-ups for some people or even an entry level because of the price point of some of the buyers that you have in terms of their income? We do have a lot of dual income wage earners. We do have a lot of people with pent-up demand. They've been saving some money. Uh, look at the vacancy rate in some areas. What about the fact that, that there are high occupancy rates in certain types of properties? And what about those people possibly moving out into a purchase of some sort? Uh, look at the weaknesses. We're seeing a lot of sales prices higher than the comps. People are still bidding at a very, very, very high pace over the market. There's still those multiple offers. Uh, what about some maintenance that might happen in the future years? Just because a roof is new doesn't mean it's a good roof. See, a new roof to me is a new roof. That year, that month, that day. When does a new roof become a newer roof? And when does a newer roof become an old roof? And when does an old roof become an older roof? And let's forget all of that. We have what's called effective age and actual age. Some people put on very, 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 very inexpensive roofs that are brand new. But they may only be 15-year shingles versus someone who gets 50-year shingles or a metal roof. So what are some additional maintenance issues? Are, are the appliances energy efficient? Do you know what the SEER ratio is of the air conditioning and the furnace? They may be in good shape, but they're very inefficient, very inefficient. What are some opportunities as you talk to clients? Can you start to convert some renters or leasing uh, tenants to purchase some entry-level housing? Are you marketing? 
See, as you well know from the time we spent together, if you've been here for a few weeks or for the first time you'll hear this, I believe every agent should buy at least two income producing properties a year. That puts tenants in there, builds wealth, creates passive income. But more importantly, those are potential clients. I have no better feeling in my life than to look back at all my tenants who I was able to convert into homeowners. What a good feeling for both of us. I love when they have to move out because I found them a home. They made it through that time in life where they had a rent they couldn't buy for whatever reason. I may have given them a rent to own option, which I do in all my houses, so they can build up some equity and realize the potential of this house could be theirs as a rent to own tenant. But most of all, converting tenants into buyers. Find some buildings. I've got a coaching student right now in Northern Illinois who is constantly marketing to some rental buildings. She's actually holding bingos in their meeting rooms just to talk about real estate and have a good evening. Got some sponsors. What opportunities are you overlooking in the tenant marketplace to convert into purchasers? And or what are you looking at to possibly buy? Example, I just came back from an appointment today. Gentleman there said, I'm looking for an apartment to rent. I gave him some ideas. Nothing seems to fit. So I asked him a simple idea. How long do you think you might be willing to rent a place? He said, ah, three to five years. So I said, let's do this because I've done it and it works. Many, many, many times over my years in real estate, I've had the ability to see someone who came in our office and wanted a rent to be able to find them a home that was for sale and no, they couldn't buy it. But I did my due diligence and I bought it and rented to them and they became my tenant. And I could share examples. That's an opportunity in this marketplace. And then the threats, I'm not worried too much about threats, but you have to worry about threats. Things that are happening, whether it's foreclosures in some market areas, price reductions, price increases, taking people out of the market. But a SWOT analysis has to be a part of your CPR on a regular basis. Because as a realty organization, individual or team, you have to have the consistency, the persistency, and the resiliency to survive under a market like this or any other market we're going to have. Our system goes from inflation to recession, from inflation to recession, from inflation to recession. That's a consistent pattern. It's a question of how long and how deep or shallow will that go. With that said, CPR, and you'll notice the last part of CPR is PR. So a big part of your CPR is your image. What do people perceive you at? Who knows you're in the real estate business? Is it on your car or vehicle? Is it a license plate? Is it your name tag on everything you do, everything you go, every place you are? How do people know you are in real estate every time you're out in the public eye? If you're in a cold climate, do you have at least two name badges, one to wear on your inside clothing and one to wear on your outerwear? So when you walk into a store with your coat on to go shopping, they see a name tag on the outside? What's your PR? What's your image? I'm going to give you a word. Image. Five word definition. Using I-M-A-G-E. I'll make a great entrance. Be honest with yourself. Every place you go. As a real estate professional, are you making a great entrance? And we've got voice and face inflection. We've got using names, might be some visuals that you have, could be a certain color you wear, could be the car you drive, could be a number of things. Could be the questions you ask. Are you making a great entrance? That's part of your CPR. But more importantly, the first word is consistency. Now look at yourself so far this year. We've basically gone through five months. Five twelfths of the year is history. What has been your consistent strength 
in the last five months? Was it the time you start work each day? Is it your to-do list? Is it a prioritized to-do list? What are the most consistent things you do? Do you go on to the MLS at a certain time each morning when you wake up and once in the afternoon or once in the evening? Or do you do it every other day? When do you find out what's happening to interest rates? When do you look at the, the clients that you haven't talked to for a while? Is there a consistent plan that you call clients on a certain time frame, certain basis, or in a certain way? I have a client right now I just left a voice message to and a text message. He likes to communicate that way. We texted, and then he said, leave me a message. He'll get back to me. We complete our communications, but we never time talk asynchronous. He's happy. He's busy. I'm happy. I'm busy. I'm doing what my client wants. That's a consistent plan. Somebody else does not want a text message. Somebody wants a phone call. Someone wants a detailed message. So look at your consistency. I'll give you three components of a very effective consistency plan. And listen to me carefully, please. I said effective consistency plan, not efficient consistency plan. Before we leave today, you're going to find out why I firmly believe in effectiveness first, efficiency second. And I had the privilege of learning that from a world-renowned management girl, Peter Drucker. You're welcome to read any of Peter Drucker's work. He was a consultant to every major corporation in the United States and many, many in Europe and Asia. Peter Drucker was a management guru. And his books are still right on. But he talked a lot about effectiveness and efficiency. So your consistency should be, I feel, each week, Work on bringing one saleable listing first. You want saleable sellers. And you can use the criteria you love and learn from your company, from a seminar or someplace. I have a saleability checklist. A man named Price Bowie, who owned a large company in Western Illinois that I had the privilege of training years ago, explained that to me. My mentor, Floyd Wickman, convinced me how powerful that is. So between Price Bowie and Floyd Wickman, I understand the power of each week bringing in a saleable listing first. And now I'm passing that on to you. From Price Bowie's mouth, to Floyd Wickman's mouth, to Wayne's mouth, to your mouth. Each week work on bringing in a saleable listing first. The best, most effective thing you can do is each week getting face to face, eyeball to eyeball with a person that can sign something. Boom, 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 boom. Everything else is not going to accomplish nearly what that will. In fact, most of the other stuff you should be delegating if you're seriously into consistency. Other people can do some other things you don't need to be doing. That's called opportunity cost. We cover that later. So are you getting face to face with somebody who can sign something? You have to do your numbers and talk about how many people you got to get in front of so they will sign something. That's your, that's your activity log. But that's consistency. The second part of a formula of consistency is separate lookers from buyers. Now, I'm sure you're well aware of the many times you've had many, many people that were lookers and not buyers. And it was so easy for you to spend a whole day, a half a day, or even longer in time doing a lot of activity with no accomplishment because they were not buyers. They were lookers. So what do we have so far? Each week, work on bringing a saleable listing first, separate lookers from buyers, and then the third component to me, because it's, it's financially in your best interest, is sell your own properties first or sell your company's properties first. Sell in-house inventory first, yours or your company's. That creates a whole different aura of the power of a company. So simply, consistency to Wayne as your wealth whisperer is to each week bring in a saleable listing first, separate lookers from buyers, and sell in-house inventory. Now, there's many other things. For example, you're all going to drive home tonight. You're going to leave from wherever your last call was home. That's consistency. You're going home tonight. Here's the twist. 
Try this to be consistent. Each night you drive home, go a different way. What did he say? He said, go a different way. You're still going to get home, but go down a side street, take a back road, take the, uh, the shortest route. Whatever you can. If you go shopping, you'll see many people in different aisles. If you go down all the aisles, you're in the grocery store. Consistency is not the same thing over and over again. It's doing things in a way that they're on a regular basis, but they could change internally. So I would never think of going home the same way when I was looking for FISBOs or just looking to see if there were some other listings in the neighborhood or area I marketed. Who else is selling in my neighborhood? There might be two, 300 homes in one of your farm areas. Have you driven all the streets on the way home? Well, I didn't see that. It's a new listing. Oh, wow, I didn't realize that. Well, there's a for sale by owner. Wow, I didn't realize that. So consistency is not the same old, same old. It's doing things in a certain way that you're consistent, but there could be some little idiosyncrasies. Your consistency is critical. But in, more importantly, as part of your business plan is part of your selling skills. There are going to be some consistent ways you do things. I like to call them tracks. That's how I learn them. Consistency to me is the guy that drives the metro train from the suburbs into the city of Chicago. They go on the same tracks each day around the same times. Their schedule is pretty much the same, but they don't have to steer the train. It steers itself because they stayed on track. So consistency in your buyer counseling session, in your seller counseling session, is doing the same thing all the time. It's also a tremendous tool to avoid any fair housing violations, to prove you treated everybody in the same way. You consist consistently did the same thing. So you didn't treat one group of people different than another group of people. So there's a lot of ways you can practice consistency. My question to you today, the first Friday of June, is how does your consistency look on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? We'll talk about that as a routine maybe in the future. See, what kind of routine do you have that's consistent? I go home each night. That's my routine. But I go a different way home to see what's in the marketplace. I take a different road. I can slide over two streets, three streets, and see a whole different set of property I never saw before. You know what I'm saying? The question is, can you do it? Will you do it? And do you want to make a more consistent plan in your lifestyle? Now, we could spend many other examples in a way that makes sense to you, but you got to start thinking, what can you do to be consistent? And what can you eliminate? Because it's not consistent. It's haphazard. It's not part of a goal. It wastes time. See, a lot of people will do a lot of low priority things on their to-do list because they look busy. They'll get on the MLS. They'll go to a couple broker opens. They'll go to some other meeting. They'll do something. But it's not the highest priority activity. Consistency in real estate is doing the highest priority activity every day. And you know what it is. Face to face, eyeball to eyeball. Belly to belly with somebody who can sign something, buyers or sellers. So let's leave that one aside and realize the fact that there's a lot of other words that you may have thought about as consistency. It's a continued plan. It's something familiar. I mean, even the way you get out of bed each day, what's the first thing you do? Second thing you do? Third thing you do? What's your pattern? That's okay at home, but what's your pattern when you leave between your home in the office. Is there a place you stop before all the time? Is there a place you go by? Do you wave to a lot of people? How many people do you say hello to in the morning? And if you want to have some communication, you got to start talking to them. Persistency. That's the P in CPR. Are you a persistent person? person. My mentor wrote in his book he gave to me to my never give up guy because he knew I was a persistent person. When I hear the word no in real estate, 
it's not spelled N-O. In my mind, that no, that potential client uttered to me, or a current client who does, doesn't want to do a price reduction or make some changes, is it's saying K-N-O-W. They don't know enough as to why that's important to say yes or why they should hire me to say yes. I didn't do my job well, so they said no. If I would have done more, told them more, shared more, they probably would have said yes. So are you persistent? Now, here's the difficulty. And this is really part of what I call a closing strategy. J. Douglas Edwards, the guru of teaching people across the country how to close in sales. And you're welcome to read some of his material. J. Douglas Edwards, a powerhouse in teaching salespeople how to close. Taught me several things. The best thing he taught me was, if you close no more than three times and close no less than three times, but always close at least three times, you always get what you want most of the time without pushing people beyond repair. I learned that from other people also. But J. Douglas Edwards actually showed research that said top producers closed on the average of seven attempts. The problem with trying to close seven times is you can push people beyond repair. So starting today, please try to find three or more different closes. You can use, because if you always close no more than three times and always close no less than three times and close three times, you always get what you want and not push people beyond repair. You can get three no's before they start to get irritated with you. Now, some will give you four, five, six, or seven, but trial closes are powerful. There are six major kinds of closes. I'd love to share that in a future podcast. Your minor point close, your assumptive close, your sharp angle close. Your tentative close, your expander close, and your rapport builder close. Those are closes. But if you don't know three, how can you close three times? Most salespeople aren't persistent in their business model. For number one, they don't know how to close. They don't know three different or four or five different closings. Douglas Edwards said, you got to do at least three and you won't pe push people beyond repair. So when's the last time you closed at least three times? What's your persistency in keeping in touch with someone? How often do you send them something? Do you follow up? Some of you are very familiar with pop buys. Pop buys is a tremendous idea. Ad specialties are a powerful idea to stay within people's mindset, being persistent. They get something from you, a newsletter, a pod, a blog, whatever it is. How are you persistent? What do we do here? I'm on Friday at noon all the time. My partner Michael's on at 11 o'clock on Luxury Fridays and many other top EXP agents are on the rest of the prior to the week. We are persistent about providing you some items you can use to become better because we all want the same thing. It's a question of, do you want those things? Many people learn a lot, but don't something with it. See, knowledge is not power. You can read all the books. You can go to all the seminars and be persistent about attending all these events and doing these things. But wow, if you don't use them, nothing happens. See, knowledge is only potential power. It does not become power until you use it. One of our presidents, Calvin Coolidge, in many of his quotes, and you're welcome to read some of his material, said the world is full of educated derelicts. Now, that's not an insult. It's a fact. A lot of people know a lot of stuff, but don't use it. So are you persistent? Do you have a no give up strategy? What things do you do? And in closing, at least three times. In keeping in touch on a regular basis, you and your clients decide what's a regular basis. And keep a log. It's so easy with Excel spreadsheets or other methods or some of your CRMs. How often did you call this person? When's the last time you called that person? What notes do you have from that call? Hey, I talked to you about your painting. Is it all done? Hey, I just noticed that. Hey, how's that going? Whatever it is, I don't care. I don't really want to know. I just want to know that you're doing it. And here's the key. Here's the key 
and, and, and in Wayne's world, the words I like to say, the bottom line is persistency has to be coupled with patience. Because patience is a very serious part of this business that we call real estate. We need to be patient. Not everybody does it the way you would like. Not every seller is ready to do what you want. Not every buyer's agent qualifies their buyers like they should. A lot of things happen that you have to be patient about. Impatience is one of the dangers of this business. But the key is you've got to be persistent. And so I leave you with this idea, with this quote, with this mindset. Patience without persistence leads to paralysis. Your deal, your relationship just stops. Are you patient, but are you persistent? Some people don't change as fast, don't buy in as quick, don't catch on like they should. You've got to slowly ease them into it. You've got to be patient, but you've got to be persistent. Because if you're not, the whole deal just kind of paralyzes and dies a slow death. It freezes. And many of you had frozen deals. They don't get back to you, dot, 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 dot. So that's the P in CPR. Can you start to see how your consistency and your persistency is giving you some hopefully life-saving strategies? See, the key is success takes an ongoing effort and persistency. And you spell success. Well, I guess there's a question. How do you spell success? And I'm sure you're thinking, well, Wayne, S-U-C-C-E-S-S. Uh-uh. In Wayne's world, success is spelled C-O-N-T-R-O-L. And persistency gives you control. If you're not persistent, you lose control. How many of you have lost a listing because you didn't call fast enough and somebody else called a day before you? You didn't reach out and follow up. See, persistency always comes with patience. Don't forget that. But patience without persistence leads to paralysis. Simple fact, oftentimes overlooked, and the results just don't become positive. If you're persistent, you'll get it. If you are consistent, you keep it. Now, there we are, summarizing the first two points of our time together today. And I do appreciate your taking the time on Fridays to hopefully pick up a few ideas in the world of wealth. And you're going to start to see with today's event, I keep bringing things other in than just using money as the whole process of wealth building. Because health is wealth. And selling skills are wealth and other aspects of your real estate life and career are wealth. So it's not just money. Wealth is much more than money. That's for sure. Frederick Herzberg, a renowned scientist back in the 1920s, first researched this and it still holds true today. Money is not a motivator, it's a satisfier. Powerful concept, you may not agree. I'm just sharing the research that still holds up. I'm very satisfied with my life. Many of you are very satisfied with your life. The money helps. And there's a lot of advantages of it. But the bottom line is, if you are persistent, you get it. If you're consistent, you keep it. Explode the sales myth that once a client's always a client. Once a customer's always a customer. That is a myth. Blow it away. It's not reality. With that said, here's the R. Resiliency. Can you bounce back? I've yet to find in any medical journal, any police report where a person drowned by falling in the water. I've never seen that in my entire life. People do not drown because they fall in the water, off the boat off the cliff, off the side of a pool. They drowned because they didn't get out. They didn't bounce back. There's a very old phrase 
It's been used by several people. I've thought about it a lot. I use it a lot. A setback is a setup for a comeback. That's resiliency. A setback is a setup for a comeback. So you had a setup. Did you move forward from that setup? Or did you take that setback and not even get a setup for a comeback? You just accepted it. A setback is a setup for a comeback. That's the best definition I've learned that I can share with you of what resiliency is. You're willing to take three steps forward, but you'll take two steps back, but you'll take three steps forward, and you'll take two steps back, and you'll take three steps forward, and you'll take two steps back, and you'll take three steps forward, and you'll take two steps back. That's resiliency. I stepped back two, but I went three. I'll get there eventually. The resiliency says I had a setback, but it's a setup for a comeback. Back two, forward three. Back two, forward three. Back two, forward three. Now, maybe it's back one, forward three. Maybe it's back one, forward four. That's the growth pattern. But at least if you're always moving forward by having at least one more step forward, you're going to grow. Your resiliency is your ability to bounce back. There's loads of books, there's loads of theories, there's loads of ideas on what resiliency really is. Some people just get knocked down and get back up. Some people get knocked down and get back up. There's stories, there's stories of how many experiments scientists did before they got successful. There's stories about Abraham Lincoln, how many times he failed in elections and finally became president. There's loads of stories out there, many people were turned down, turned away, told no, but they were consistent and persistent and resilient. So look at your resiliency factor. How do you bounce back after something happens? Could be a devastating part of your life. Could be resiliency in how you handle the death in the family, how you handle the loss of a client. You had a listing for so many months and they left you. You had a, you had a deal fall through. Are you resilient? Because that's going to be something that moves you to the next level. If you're not resilient, when you're knocked down, you stay down. When you fall in the water, you drown. You've got to be resilient. That's the real key component. Now, with that said, we've now got the package. We got the CPR. Now, my mindset and hopefully your mindset is how do I keep looking at this on a regular basis to practice CPR? See, right now, it's a great idea. But in six weeks, in six months, is it going to continue to be a part of your life-saving success strategy as an agent? I've got to give myself CPR. Stuff happens. That's where they got those shirts. With that said, that resilience is based on vision, on preventive strategies, on your ability to switch. We called it, we called it pivoting during COVID. I had a pivot. Well, that was a resilient factor. A lot of people were able to pivot. Did you pivot? Did you look at things differently in the middle of a crisis that nobody imagined? Are you positive? Are you optimistic? See, optimistic people tend to be more resilient because they look at things. Teamwork helps in creating resilience. Flexibility. I mean, my theory is very simple. If you can't spell a word two ways, you're not flexible. Thank God for spell check. See, I spell resilience, R-E-S-I-L-E-N-C-E. -E. I can't hear that I, so what's the difference? Spell check will correct it. If I can't hear the letter, why am I putting it in there? Resilience, R-E-S-I-L-E-N-C-E. -E. I know what I'm saying. Do you know what I'm saying? Your ability to pivot is your agility. The ability is your agility. Remember that. The ability is your agility to be resilient. If you're an agile person, you can shift gears. 
And shifting gears allows you to reach out and grow versus shriveling up and quitting. See, that's the other aspect of resiliency. Are you reaching out and growing or shriveling up and quitting? So take a look at all these words and see which ones really are you in how you bounce back. How do you handle pressure? Some people are blown away by pressure. Look at on the far left at the bottom, power, P-O-W-E-R. In Wayne's world, my five-word definition of power that to me proves resilience is the psychology of winning equals results. I am a lousy loser. I don't like to lose. I like to win. Now, unfortunately, it almost happened for many years. My wonderful mother told me I got to learn to be a good loser after I lost in an event in grade school or, 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 or some other event in high school. You got to be a good loser, Wayne. And I realized, wait a minute. If I'm going to learn to be a good loser, that's all I'm going to be in life is a good loser. I got to bounce back. I'm a lousy loser. I want to find out what I did wrong and make it better. So there's a lot of words here. A lot of words here. Obviously, as you're resilient, you become stronger. I met the gym three times a week, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Hour and a half. Hadn't done that for years. Started last December. Made a big difference. What's your effort? There's your strengths. There's that SWOT analysis. Your strengths will help you become more resilient. If you're not using your strengths, you're probably going to have a harder time staying resilient. But consistency, persistency, and resiliency is what today's message was all about because that's the CPR. With that said, a real estate agent SWOT analysis has many different things. And I realized when I put this screen up, it might not have been easy to read. So I'm going to read some of these to you. In your strength, you're welcome to jot these down. How do you handle an offer and what kind of services do you provide? What's your unique selling proposition, your USP? Do you know the uh, tax policies and laws you can share with people to suggest they go to an accountant? For example, many agents don't even talk about having their sell buyers appeal taxes and show them the process and then let them go to an attorney or someone who can do that tax appeal for them. Uh, do you have a strong digital presence? Do you make uh, TikTok videos to gather business? Are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter? Your weaknesses, is your budget limited? Are you not spending the money most businesses do to build their business? What a great time to build your business. Several weeks ago on one of our seminars, I talked about the credit card I was offered that I had to get right away, 21 months at 0% interest with a 3% transfer fee. So if I borrow $20,000, it's going to cost me 600 bucks, about a dollar a day. And I got 20,000 to build my business with. And I got two years to pay it back, basically. If I can't do it in two years, gosh, maybe I should go work at Walmart or Costco because they're hiring. Do you have a weak marketing plan? That's a weakness. When's the last time someone else looked at your marketing plan and analyzed it for you? Are you not working on bringing in a saleable listing first or you have a few listings? Listings are the name of the game, always have been, always will be. Hopefully in one of the future events that we have each Friday, I'll share my list to exist program. But you know the power of listings. The name of the game always have been, always will be. Do you not have enough connections and contacts? And very simply, and this is a weakness for a lot of agents, we have poor management skills. We're not managers. We're usually high, high eye people that have fun. Some of you have management skills, but many agents do not have management skills. That's why we're a prime target for audits, because we're not good at record keeping. And the IRS knows it. What are your opportunities? Can you outsource some marketing activities? I said earlier, work on bringing in a saleable listing first. You cannot make $200,000 this year in $20 an hour work. 
It's impossible financially and time-wise. You can't make 300,000 this year doing $30 an hour work, and you surely can't make 500,000 spending time doing $50 an hour work. So I now know I can pay somebody a pretty good salary to help me. My goal is to make whatever number I wanna make. Also, look at your competitors. How does your online presence compare to them today? Do a Google search with your name in town or real estate agents in your town. Who pops up first? Who's got a better search engine optimization? There's some great seminars done in our group each week on social selling. Lisa does some, many other agents pop up as guest speakers. Opportunity, rising prices. If you're not negotiating a down position, you're making more money. It may take a little more work, but rising prices, as long as you don't cut your commission, understand the marketplace. And above all, understand the power of what's happening in your neighborhoods, in your subdivisions, in terms of gentrification. Those are opportunities. I see a lot of it in my market area and in Chicago and in the suburbs. And then just a couple of quick threats. New competitors, different models, change in legislation, market trends, and cash flow. We know a lot of people would love to buy a house, but they lost a lot of purchasing power because interest rates went up. That's just a fact of life, but they're still not much different than they were four years ago. So it's not like we're totally out in the wild west with high interest rates. We've got issues, but it'll happen. Things will get better. They always do. The cycle is inflation, recession, inflation, recession. Just a reminder, those who don't understand history are bound to repeat it. So if you understand the last recession that's going to be coming soon, according to some people, you know what they handle when it comes, comes next year or before the end of the year. Inflation, if you know what happened at worst 40 years ago or somewhere in 2004 and six, you know what to do this time. Fed raised rates 17 times. Last time we had a concern like this in 2004, five and six. 17 times in a row they raised interest rates. We're looking at maybe the third one coming up on June 15 when they meet again. The only difference, this one might be 50 basis points instead of 25. And if it does happen, I think it'll be the first time I remember when the Fed had two consecutive rate increases of 50 basis points in two meetings. They meet every six weeks, basically. So a SWOT analysis looks at those kind of items. With that said, we have to realize what I said earlier today that it's effectiveness first, efficiency second. This is Peter Drucker talking. This is what I heard from Peter Drucker. And so he gave me a very simple definition, and I looked at it in a dictionary, and it pretty much is right on. Efficiency is doing things right. Effectiveness is doing the right thing. Now let's think about that. Efficiency, doing things right. You're here today, you listened. It's very efficient. Somebody didn't come on today, didn't listen. They're not as efficient as you. But now, how are you going to take this and do the right thing with it? That's effectiveness. Effectiveness first, efficiency second. Or, as I like to put it, it's always, always, always better to do the right thing than to do things right. It's always better to do the right thing than to do things right. So as you look at each day, as you start with your consistency, is your consistency an effective consistency or just an efficient consistency? Are you doing things right? And obviously, that could mean anything. It's so easy in this business to confuse activity with accomplishment. It's very efficient. You can be here, be there, spend time here, talk to those people there, sit in the office, talk to other people about stuff, go to coffee. You can do a lot of things. Many, many times, agents in the office years ago would say, let's go to lunch. I say, nah. Well, you got to eat lunch? Yeah, but I think I'd like to go eat lunch where there might be some potential clients. You're not going to buy or sell a house with me, are you? So I would go to lunch either by myself or with other people that could be clients or potential clients because I can't get any business from my colleagues. I'm gracious with time, but I'm also ruthless with time. 
and I'm gracious with people. So effectiveness first, efficiency second. It's always better to do the right thing than to do things right. So I guess as you look at your consistency and your persistency, and then maybe your resiliency, are you doing the right thing each day? The highest priority activity to me is the right thing, getting face to face with somebody who can sign something. Everything else is efficient. And hopefully with technology, with ways you handle your, your plan, you'll be more efficient. You can always get more efficient, but that will not make you more effective. So I know you all are aware of people that build houses, that repair houses, that fix houses. They're contractors. They have a very simple philosophy that they understand without even knowing it's Peter Drucker's philosophy. They practice this almost always if they're good and serious. A good contractor, a good repair person, a good handyman doing work has a very simple philosophy. Measure twice, cut once. Measure twice, cut once. They know if they only measure once, they have to cut twice. That takes more time. If they ruin product, it costs more money to replace. So they measure twice and we have to cut once. So is your life starting today going to be a measuring twice to cut once? Will you be effective first and efficient second? That's all I'm asking. That's all I'm asking. Effectiveness first, efficiency second. You can take that one step further and combine the two and always do the right things right. That really is the ultimate. I'm doing the right thing and I'm doing them right. And there's many examples of that. So as we go back and look at what we've just done, we've taken a very simple concept, CPR. And we put it together in a successful selling seminar. And we looked at the word re resiliency as one part of what I call the three R's. In the future, and maybe next week will be our topic of relationships and routine along with resiliency. So we're starting with a CPR concept. We have to realize the power of CPR is in its consistency, its persistency, and its resiliency. I hope I've shared with you a number of ideas that you can take to the bank and make yours, that you can start to put together a life-saving plan with a SWOT analysis of your business model. I guess I talked a little fast, so we've got a few extra minutes. I'll let you go and get your lunch started. Thanks for having a mental snack with me. Have a good week. See you next week on World of Wealth. Have a good day.